Augmandino's University of Success Semester 2 kicks off with a guiding principle from an Eastern European man born way back between 342 and 347. And his name was Jerome. And Jerome grew up to become one of the Christian fathers of the Catholic Church. And because of his writings and teachings, Jerome has since been designated by the Catholic Church as Saint Jerome. Jerome was a monk and once described himself as a eunuch by choice, a eunuch by choice, a eunuch for the kingdom. Jerome lived for a time in Rome. And while he was living in Rome, Jerome was often associated with nobles, with rich, powerful, and influential people of his day. One of whom was a wealthy patrician woman, she was a widow, named Eustochium Julia, E-U-S-T-O-C-H-I-U-M, Eustochium. Julia, hereafter referred to as EJ. And around the year 384, this wealthy widowed woman, EJ, made a vow of perpetual virginity. In other words, as we would say today, she took the veil and became a nun. And in her new life as a renunciate, Jerome became her spiritual advisor and mentor. And Jerome often wrote letters or epistles to EJ providing instruction and encouragement in her spiritual development as a nun. EJ is now considered one of the desert mothers of Christianity. They're desert mothers, there are desert fathers. These are nuns and monks who left the more urban areas and went out into the desert and cloistered themselves in communities for the lifelong study of God and contemplation of spiritual things. Some call this the contemplative life. So St. Jerome and EJ were among those. In one of those letters that St. Jerome wrote to EJ as her spiritual advisor and mentor, St. Jerome wrote this, as often as this world's vain display delights you, as often as you see in life some empty glory, Transport yourself in thought to paradise and begin to be now what you will be hereafter. Now, brothers and sisters, this bears repeating several times. St. Jerome. And this letter was written in 383 or 384 in our common era. Jerome wrote, As often as this world's vain display delights you, as often as you see in life some empty glory, transport yourself in thought to paradise and begin to be now what you will be hereafter. And it is from this letter and this quote that Augmandino derives his guiding principle for semester two of his 1982 book, University of Success. The guiding principle for semester two of the University of Success is from St. Jerome. Begin to be now what you will be hereafter. Begin to be now what you will be hereafter. And I do want to say one thing about that because context is key. Context is key. And we see that Brother Augmandino is only using the last part of St. Jerome's quote. The full sentence, as I read, is, As often as this world's vain display delights you, as often as you see in life some empty glory, transport yourself in thought to paradise and begin to be now what you will be hereafter. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So let's get into it. The second semester of Augmandino's University of Success kicks off with this thought from St. Jerome. As often as this world's vain display delights you, as often as you see in life some empty glory, transport yourself in thought to paradise and begin to be now what you will be hereafter. Begin to be now what you will be hereafter. All right, so let's get it. In January of 1979, Keith DeGreen's book, Creating a Success Environment, was published. And it is from Keith DeGreen that we receive the guiding thought for Lesson 6, How to Accept the Challenge of Success. The guiding thought for Lesson 6 is this. 
to succeed means that you may have to step out of line and march to the sound of your own drummer. In lesson six, how to accept the challenge of success. Author Keith DeGreen, in his 1979 book, Creating a Success Environment, asks 12 questions. 12 questions. So get your pen, <laughs> get your paper, get your device, and jot down these 12 questions. And in your quiet time, go back and contemplate the answers to these 12 questions posed by Mr. Keith DeGreen in his 1979 book, Creating a Success Environment. These are the questions. Number one, do you really believe you were put here to fail? Do you really believe you were put here to fail? That's the first question. Number two, is it wrong to be rich? Is it wrong to be rich? Number three, do you have to go through hell to get to heaven? Do you have to go through hell to get to heaven? Question number four, isn't being here all the permission you need? Isn't being here all the permission you need? Question five, who will control your life? Who will control your life? That's the fifth question. Number six, were you designed to be led? Were you designed to be led? Number seven, do you prefer mediocrity? Because some people do. Do you prefer mediocrity? Question number eight, do you accept responsibility for you? Do you accept responsibility for you? Number nine, will you prevent your own success? Will you prevent your own success? Number 10, do you feel that you deserve success? Do you feel that you deserve success? Question number 11, will you wait for the world to come to you? Will you wait for the world to come to you? And the last question is, will you act now? Will you act now? Those are the 12 questions. And 12, brothers and sisters, is a powerful spiritual number. And anytime you are decoding numbers, turn to Brother E.W. Bullinger and to his book, Number in Scripture. It's supernatural design and spiritual significance. Brother E.W. Bullinger was born in 1837 and died, left his body, ascended in 1913. And number in scripture was originally published in 1921. So now let us go back and dig a little deeper on some of these questions. Question one, do you really believe you were put here to fail? Mr. Keith DeGreen on page 53 directs us to the biblical story of the parable of the talents, the parable of the talents, which you can find in the biblical book of Matthew chapter 25. So go there, ponder that parable and see what your higher self says to you about this question. Do you really believe you were put here to fail? Question number two, is it wrong to be rich? Page 54, Mr. Keith DeGreen writes, to the extent that money is a measure of the services we perform for others, its accumulation is noble. To the extent that we press our money into the service of those we love to provide them with as warm and as comfortable and as secure an existence as possible, its disbursement is inspired and divine. Question number three, do you have to go through hell to get to heaven? Page 55, if our being here proves anything, it is that we must accept the challenge of using the tools and talents that we possess. Our purpose is to make our lives as successful and as happy as we possibly can. Rather than being a mantle of suffering, we should view our existence here as a dress rehearsal for the eternity of happiness we deserve. Question number four, isn't being here all the permission you need? Page 55. To succeed requires that we step out of line, away from the pack, 
and march to the sound of our personal distant drummer. So we wait for the voice of some subconscious teacher to excuse us from the room before we begin. Yet that voice will never come unless it comes from us. Question number seven. Now, the number seven is a master number. Brother E.W. Bullinger writes that seven is the great number of spiritual perfection. Question number seven. Do you prefer mediocrity? Page 58. Mr. Keith DeGreen writes, Man generally is not equipped for mediocrity. His imagination is merciful. Generally, we cannot imagine those things that we cannot accomplish. In the classic self-help volume, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, it is written, quote, Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, he can achieve, end quote. We would not be equipped with the ability to imagine future accomplishment and conditions if we were not correspondingly equipped with the ability to turn those imaginings into reality. But mediocrity may look comfortable. We all know those who have settled into a routine job at a routine salary and who live in a routine home in a routine neighborhood. They seem routinely comfortable and happy, at least from the outside, but on the inside, they must contend daily with the rationalizations they have accepted and the non-use of the abilities that they possess. The tension thus created is anything but comfortable. Question number eight. Do you accept responsibility for you? Page 59. We frequently use diversion in our lives as a tool to avoid direct confrontation with our innermost feelings and to avoid accepting total responsibility for who we are and what we do. One more again, because diversion and distraction, brothers and sisters, are major stumbling blocks for so many of us. So let's rewind that. We frequently use diversion in our lives as a tool to avoid direct confrontation with our innermost feelings and to avoid accepting total responsibility for who we are and what we do. Question number 10. Do you feel that you deserve success? Page 60. How can you not deserve success? Your success is not measured relative to what others say or do or accomplish. It is merely the extent to which you utilize the potential that you possess. If part of your personal potential package includes a tendency to be forgetful or clumsy or whatever, that element makes you no less deserving of success. It is merely part of the total you. It is a characteristic that must, in its own way, be made to work for you when at all possible. But others, you think, are obviously smarter or younger or harder working or more educated or better looking. They deserve success more than I do, you think. But the characteristics of others remain irrelevant to your success. Let's rewind that. But the characteristics of others remain irrelevant to your success. While the tendency to compare ourselves to others may be overwhelming, it is not against them we compete. Page 61. It is only our tendency not to utilize all the potential we possess against which we must constantly fight. Success is not something that must be deserved or earned. It is more an inherent right, an inherent responsibility. The only qualification for success is that you be you that you utilize whatever combination of talent you possess to the fullest extent possible. Do you deserve success? Of course you do. You deserve no less. 
Question number 11. Will you wait for the world to come to you? Page 61. The next time you catch yourself daydreaming, about someone or something coming to you, stop yourself and resolve to do whatever is necessary to go to him or her or they or it. If indeed the world ever does beat a path to your door, it will do so only after it first discovers who you are and where you can be reached. You must supply the world with this information. That's a key, brothers and sisters. You must supply the world with this information. What information? Who you are and where you can be located. You must let it know, the world, that you are here, that you are eager to do business, and that you offer to the world something of value to it. We must resist our tendency to believe that the world will come to us, that things will happen to us. We must go to it. We must happen to things. There is nothing as sad as the man who spends his entire life waiting for his ship to come in when he never sent one out. Don't spend your life waiting for that quote unquote big break. Don't rely upon luck. Make your own. Your talent may be enormous, your potential may be great, but talent and potential unannounced to the rest of the world is wasted. Question number 12. Will you act now? Page 62. There are few who have the right to criticize. Only those who stand by our side on the firing line and to suffer the same challenges as we do possess the right. Only those who, as Theodore Roosevelt said, are with us in the arena with soiled hands and sweaty brows and a sense of purpose and daring and dedication may criticize us. For now is the only time that we have. That's worth repeating. For now is the only time that we have. It is our only negotiable currency. Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. It is only today that we may spend in the noble effort of using all the gifts that God gave us. Augmandino's University of Success. Lesson 7. How to give your dreams a chance to come true. How to give your dreams a chance to come true. Before we go on, I want you to know that I bought this book on Amazon some years ago. And when it arrived, the title page of the book, Augmandino's University of Success, was inscribed by the previous owner from March of 2000. And here's what the previous owner of this book wrote on the title page. Personal mission statement to positively touch the lives of others and to always strive daily to live, love, learn, and leave a legacy. Personal mission statement to positively touch the lives of others and to always strive daily to live, love, learn, and leave a legacy. Sounds good to me. So let's get it. Lesson seven, how to give your dreams a chance to come true. In 1959, Richard M. DeVos and his business partner started the Amway Company. Amway, A-M-W-A-Y, Amway. Some of y'all are familiar with Amway. Back in the day, my Aunt Flossie sold products for a rival company called Shackley. Y'all remember Shackley? Shackley products? Y'all got an aunt who used to sell Amway or Shackley in the family? Maybe you have an Avon lady in your family or a Mary Kay woman in your family. Well, Richard DeVos and his business partner started Amway in 1959. Many of us remember the name DeVos and others of us are very much happy to forget the name DeVos. Nonetheless, Richard M. DeVos, co-founder of the Amway Corporation, back in 1975, authored a book called Believe! Exclamation point. And it is from Richard M. DeVos's book, Believe! that we derive Lesson 7's guiding thought, which is, the easiest thing to find on God's green earth is someone to tell you all the things you cannot do. 
the easiest thing to find on God's green earth is someone to tell you all the things you cannot do. Richard M. DeVos from his 1975 book, Believe! Exclamation point. The easiest thing to find on God's green earth is someone to tell you all the things you cannot do. Mr. DeVos offers up some simple wisdom in this lesson and in this chapter, mostly centering around the distinction between the words I can and I can't. I can and I can't. Y'all remember as a child, teenager maybe, the little engine that could. Remember the story of the little engine that could? Richard M. DeVos is bringing us into that world. The distinction between the words I can and I can't. I can't do that. I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Or I can't do that. So that's what Richard DeVos wants us to contemplate in lesson seven, how to give your dreams a chance to come true. So let's get it. Let us start by looking closely at the word can, C-A-N, can, I can. Yes, we can. The definitions of the word can, to know, to understand to be able to, to make or accomplish, to have knowledge or skill, be physically or mentally able to, have the necessary courage or resolution to, be permitted by conscience or feeling to, be made possible or probable by circumstances to, be inherently able or designed to. That sounds like soul satisfaction to me. Be inherently able or designed to the word can to be inherently able or designed to so let's get into it richard m devos lesson seven how to give your dreams a chance to come true page 66 i can it is a powerful sentence i can i do have a firm conviction that almost anyone can do whatever he really believes he can do Page 67, he talks about the value of determined, confident effort. He writes, I look back at the 40 odd years of my life. So Richard M. DeVos was in his mid 40s when he wrote this book, or at least when he wrote these words. I look back at the 40 odd years of my life, and it seems that more than any other single lesson, my experiences have conspired to teach me the value of determined, confident effort. Page 68, he writes, one never knows what he might accomplish until he tries. The important thing is that we put our minds to doing the thing we had set out to do instead of just sitting around and talking about it. I know some people like that. I'm like that sometimes. It's good to have a reminder of these things. Page 69. Give things a chance to happen. Give success a chance to happen. It is impossible to win the race unless you venture to run. Impossible to win the victory unless you dare to battle. No life is more tragic than that of the individual who nurses a dream, an ambition, always wishing and hoping, but never giving it a chance to happen. He nurses the flickering dream, but never lets it break out into flame. Millions of people are that way about having a second income or owning their own business. There are millions more who nurture private, almost secret dreams in other areas. The school teacher who wants to go back for that master's degree. The small businessman who dreams of expanding his business. The couple who has intended to make that trip to Europe. The housewife whose ambition is to write short stories for the freelance market. The list could go on and on. People dreaming, but never daring, never willing to say, I can, never trusting their dreams to the real world of action and effort. People, in short, who are so afraid of failure that they fail. For the individual in that position, there is only one thing left after all the arguments are weighed and all the costs measured. Do it. Try it. Quit talking about it and do it. How will you ever know if you can paint that picture, run that business, sell that vacuum cleaner, earn that degree, hold that office, make that speech, win that game, marry that girl, write that book, bake that souffle, build that house, unless you try it. Page 71. 
Richard M. DeVos talks about a growing conviction that the only thing that stands between a man and what he wants from life is often merely the will to try it and the faith to believe that it is possible. Why do so many people let their dreams die unlived? Why do so many people let their dreams die unlived? The biggest reason, I suppose, is the negative, cynical attitudes of other people. Those other people are not enemies. They are friends, even family members. Our enemies never bother us greatly. We can usually handle them with little trouble. But our friends, if they are naysayers, constantly punching holes in our dreams with a cynical smile here, a put down there, a constant stream of negative vibrations, our friends can kill us. A man gets excited about the possibility of a new job. He sees the opportunity to make more money, do more meaningful work, rise to a personal challenge. The old heart starts pounding and the juices begin to flow and he feels himself revving up for this stimulating new prospect. But then he tells his neighbor about it over the back fence one evening. He gets a smirk, a laugh that says, <laughs> you can't do that. A foot long list of all the problems and obstacles and 50 reasons why he never will make it and is better off to stay where he is. Before he knows it, his enthusiasm falls down to near zero. He goes back into the house like a whipped pup with his tail dragging the ground and all the fire and self-confidence is gone and he begins to second guess himself. Now he is thinking of all the reasons that he can't make it instead of the reasons that he can. He lets one five minute spiel of negativism or ridicule or just plain disbelief from a dream nothing, do nothing neighbor take the steam right out of his engine. Friends like that can do more damage than a dozen enemies. A young housewife decides to take knitting lessons so she can knit sweaters, afghans, all sorts of things. She gets a book and the needles and yarn and starts to learn the simplest knitting steps, full of visions of brightly colored mittens and clothes. Then her husband comes home from work and tells her how hard it is to knit. How she'll have to work years to be any good at it. How many women have started and quit. He gives her one of those patented patronizing smiles that says, you'll never learn to knit very well, you poor thing. And before he has left the room, she is believing more in his cynicism than in her faith. Page 72, Mr. Richard M. DeVos, in his 1975 book, Believe! Exclamation point, he closes Lesson 7, How to Give Your Dreams a Chance to Come True, with this. Don't listen to them. If you have a dream, whatever it is, dare to believe it and to try it. Give it a chance to happen. Don't listen to them. How many times over the course of our lives, brothers and sisters, we've had to just close our eyes. In the moment, it could take 30 seconds, but we've had to close our eyes and say to ourselves, don't listen to them. I have a dream. I know it. I feel it in my heart. I believe in this dream, in this possibility, and I am going to try it. I'm going to give myself in this moment a chance in my mind to succeed at this very thing. How many times have we had to have that talk from our higher self to our lower self, from one part of our soul to another part of our soul? And the lesson ends with this. Believe you can, and you will find that you can. Believe you can, and you will find that you can. If I may add one thing from my life notes to what Mr. Richard M. DeVos wrote here, believe you can and you will find that you can. I would say once you believe you can and it's in your soul that you can, that is when you open the door to I know, not I can, I know, I know, I know, I don't believe, I know, I can, I know, 
I can. That's what I would add. Augmandino's 1982 book, University of Success, Lesson 8, How to Develop Your Strength to Seize Opportunities. How to Develop Your Strength to Seize Opportunities. So let us travel back in time to New York, to the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where a baby boy named Maxwell Maltz, M-A-L-T-Z, Maxwell Maltz, was born on March 10th, 1899. Baby Maxwell's parents were Austro-Hungarian Jewish immigrants who raised this little boy, their third child, affectionately as Max. And Max grew up to graduate with a doctorate degree in medicine from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. Dr. Maxwell Maltz eventually became a prominent cosmetic surgeon and the author of several books. And it is from one of Dr. Maltz's books that we derive Lesson 8, How to Develop Your Strength to Seize Opportunities. In 1973, Dr. Maxwell Maltz's book, The Search for Self-Respect, was published. And our guiding principle for this lesson comes from that 1973 book, The Search for Self-Respect. How many of us, brothers and sisters, after whatever circumstance or situation we may have gotten ourselves into have come to a place in our mind on our journey where we began picking up the pieces of our bad behavior, searching ourselves for some self-respect. 1973, Dr. Maxwell Maltz's book, The Search for Self-Respect. Here's the guiding thought for lesson eight, how to develop your strength to seize opportunities. Quote, you may live, I may live, we may live in an imperfect world. But the frontiers are not all closed and the doors are not all shut. You may live, I may live, we may live in an imperfect world, but the frontiers are not all closed and the doors are not all shut. Well, that sounds real good to me. You may live in an imperfect world, but the frontiers are not all closed and the doors are not all shut. I received that. What does the word say in Matthew 7, 7? Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. You may live in an imperfect world, but the frontiers are not all closed and the doors are not all shut. That's the guiding principle. Keep that in your mind as we work through this lesson number eight, how to develop your strength to seize opportunities. Now, in his introduction to this lesson, Augmandino promises five secrets that will better equip you and me to handle any opportunity. Five secrets that will better equip you and me to handle any opportunity. That is the promise of this lesson, according to Og Mandino. And I would say that a key word in this lesson is the word opportunity. What is opportunity? The word opportunity breaks down like this. Opportunity, a combination of circumstances, time, and place suitable or favorable for a particular activity or action. A combination of circumstances, time, and place suitable or favorable for a particular activity or action. An advantageous circumstance or combination of circumstances. A time, place, or condition favoring advancement or progress. I like that. A time, place, or condition favoring advancement or progress. That is one definition of opportunity. A time, place, or condition favoring advancement or progress. So let's get it. Lesson eight, how to develop your strength to seize opportunities. Page 74. What is opportunity and when does it knock? It never knocks. You can wait a whole lifetime listening, hoping, and you will hear no knocking. None at all. So here's the answer to the question we asked earlier. What is opportunity? Page 74. Dr. Maltz writes, you are opportunity and you must knock on the door leading to your destiny. You prepare yourself 
to recognize opportunity, to pursue and seize opportunity as you develop the strength of your personality and build a self image with which you are able to live with your self-respect alive and growing. Opportunity covers a wide area. Some people may constrict the totality of its meaning and apply it only to work or financial success, but your opportunities in living are really much wider than this. Opportunity may also mean warding off negative feelings. It may also mean functioning under pressure. It may also mean rising above vanity, bigotry, and deceit as you strive to live with dignity. It is your responsibility to be an archaeologist digging under the debris of tension and conflict to uncover for yourself a sense of self-acceptance that will give you inner peace and comfort in our swiftly paced, always troubled world. Accessible to you may be the exciting opportunity of steering yourself to a productive goal through your growing awareness of who you are and what you can be and how you can channel your assets in practical terms toward achieving your ends. Developing your strength as you build your self-respect, you mobilize yourself for action and place yourself practically in an external sense and emotionally in an internal sense in a position to seize opportunities at the proper times. You build the caliber of your thinking. Those are some very important words put together in a very wise way right there. You build the caliber of your thinking. You build the caliber of your thinking. You build the caliber of your thinking, propelling your thoughts into and through your imagination. Then, with internal strength, you move toward your goals of fulfillment and happiness. You create opportunity. You develop the capacities for moving toward opportunity. You turn crises into creative opportunities and defeats into successes and frustrations into fulfillment with what you may be asking with your great invisible weapons your good feelings about yourself your determination to live the best life you can and your feeling that only you can give yourself that you are a worthwhile deserving person page 75 you must fight for your right to fulfill the opportunity that God gave you to use your life well. You do this when, in your mind, you support yourself instead of undermining yourself. You do this when, in your mind, you develop your creative and imaginative powers instead of worrying about what other people think or foreseeing endless disasters. You must stop complaining about your unfair fortunate past or your bad luck and open your eyes to the opportunities that exist for you. You have limitations for sure. And no matter who you are, you will sometimes meet frustrations, but you have opportunities too. And you must search for your creative powers. That's a key phrase, brothers and sisters. You must search for your creative powers so that you can move toward them. Toward what? Toward your creative powers. You explore and invent and originate and adapt. Now, let's talk about how to move toward opportunity. And let's get into those five secrets that Augmandino promised us in this lesson. Page 81. These are Dr. Maxwell Maltz's five how-tos for moving toward opportunity from his 1973 book, The Search for Self-Respect. Secret number one, keep an eye on the red light. Keep an eye on the red light. I mean the red light on your mental dashboard with which you stop yourself from moving toward your opportunities. Red lights on our streets are necessary for safety, of course. But when you stop yourself, you must ask yourself this. Am I stopping myself for realistic reasons because I am moving into a danger area? Or am I just stopping myself because my opinion of myself is too low and I do not believe 
I deserve success. Stop wasting fuel worrying about yesterday. Just as you would take care of your car, oil it, and check it out, take care of your emotional car so that it moves you toward your objectives. Stop when the red light on your mental dashboard signals a necessary slowdown, but change it to green when, for no real reason except negative feelings, you would keep yourself from moving forward down the main highway toward opportunity. Stop and start. This is the way to move toward your goals. As you formulate them and move toward them, remember your past successes and even more important, see them in your mind as if they were happening now. Thus your success lives again in your imagination so that you live and breathe the success of the past and project it into the present. Stop, but then start again. Secret number two, live in the present. Live in the present. The past is gone. The future is unknown, but the present is real and your opportunities are now. You must see these opportunities. They must be real for you. The catch is that they can't seem real if your mind is buried in past failures. If you keep reliving old mistakes, old guilts, old tragedies, fight your way above the many inevitable traumatizations of your your ego. Escape damnation by the past and look to the opportunities of the present. I don't mean some vague moment in the present next week or next month, perhaps. I mean today, this minute. The past may not be your only obstacle. Tomorrow type thinking can also block you from your goals. Yearning for a new tomorrow may often be unrealistic and negative, especially if you foresee some angel coming to your rescue and pressing a magic button for you. There is no magic button, just your own resources, your own determination, your own feeling that you have the right to succeed. Secret number three, stop belittling yourself. Stop belittling yourself. Too many people do this. Maybe you're not a celebrity or a millionaire or a football hero or an astronaut hero. You can be great if you're a sales clerk or a housewife or a car washer or a dishwasher or a garbage collector or a bill collector. Stop belittling yourself. Accept yourself as you are. That bears a repeat. That's a big one right there. Accept yourself as you are. So many of us would have much more peaceful, more productive, more purposeful lives if we accepted ourselves as we are. Accept yourself as you are. Otherwise, you will never see opportunity. You will not feel free to move toward it. You will feel you are not deserving. Accept yourself as you are. Otherwise, you will never see opportunity. You will not feel free to move toward it. You will feel you are not deserving. Secret number four. Try to set constructive goals. Try to set constructive goals. That's pretty self-explanatory. Secret number five. Stand up to crises. Stand up to crises. Don't let them throw you. Fight to stay calm. Turn a crisis into a creative opportunity. That's a mouthful right there. That's a really, really good mouthful. That's a good breadcrumb right there. Turn a crisis into a creative opportunity. That's a breadcrumb. That's a divine breadcrumb right there. Turn a crisis into a creative opportunity. Refuse to renounce your self-image. No matter what happens, you must keep your good opinion of yourself. No matter what happens, you must hold your past successes in your imagination, ready for showing in the motion picture screen of your mind. No matter what happens, no matter what you lose, no matter what failures you must endure, you must keep faith in yourself. Then you can stand up to crises with calm and courage, refusing to buckle. Then you will not fall through the floor. You will be able to support 
yourself. Look in the mirror. That's you. You must like yourself. You must accept yourself. You must be your own friend. That's wisdom right there. Underline that, circle it, highlight it. You must be your own friend. And I would only add one word. You must be your best friend. Brothers and sisters, be your own best friend. In crises, especially, you must give yourself support. That is you in the mirror. Don't look at yourself narcissistically, telling yourself you're the most perfect, wonderful, godlike individual on earth. But give yourself appreciation. Remember the crises you've lived through. See in your mind the ones you handled successfully, the ones you turned into opportunities for growth. Don't let yourself down. So let's recap the five secrets. Secret number one, keep an eye on the red light. Secret number two, live in the present. Secret number three, stop belittling yourself. Secret number four, try to set constructive goals. Secret number five, stand up to crises. Page 84, some of the greatest opportunities gain momentum in the inner space of our minds before they are ready to be propelled out into action. Think of that, the inner space of our minds, the inner verse of our minds. What a beautiful thought. Dr. Maltz continues, indeed, one of the great opportunities in your lifetime must be a direct attempt to build Build your respectful attitude toward yourself. One more again. One of the great opportunities in your lifetime must be a direct attempt to build your respectful attitude toward yourself. Surrender to the opportunity within you that you create for yourself. An opportunity that will lead you to richer living and greater self-respect. One more time. Surrender to the opportunity within you that you create for yourself. An opportunity that will lead you to richer living and greater self-respect. And here's how Dr. Maltz concludes lesson eight. Complicated person that you are, frustrated and yet confident, negative and yet positive, failure-oriented and yet success-oriented, you count down in the inner space of your mind, strengthen yourself, and then launch yourself toward today's opportunities in your world. Og Mandino's 1982 book, University of Success, Lesson 9, How to Make the Most of Your Abilities. How to Make the Most of Your Abilities. Now, Og Mandino, in his introduction to Lesson 9, writes, There is an old cattle country axiom which states, Success in life comes not from holding a good hand, but in playing a poor hand well. Success in life comes not from holding a good hand, but in playing a poor hand well. The easiest thing to do whenever you fail is to put yourself down by blaming your lack of ability for your misfortunes. The easiest thing to forget, especially when fate has been unkind, to you is that you were born to succeed, not fail. You cannot rise above the level of your vision. You cannot rise above the level of your vision. That's a good word right there. The man who guides a push cart through the alley to pick up bottles and stray bits of paper will remain between the shafts of his rickety cart as long as he believes that he has no talent for anything else. Kenneth Hildebrandt had that rare ability to make even Skid Row derelicts raise their sights and aspire to a better life. Thousands flocked to his non-denominational church, the Central Church of Chicago, and his messages from the pulpit, as well as radio and television, were a beacon of hope that still lights many hearts. Let's go back to vision. You cannot rise above the level of your vision. What is vision? We've spent a lot of time in this space over the years talking about vision. It's so important. A lot of us immediately go to the scripture that says, for lack of vision, the people perish. For lack of vision, the people perish. Many of us know that. But let's look at the definition of vision. 
vision, something seen otherwise than by the ordinary sight, an imaginary, supernatural, or prophetic sight beheld in sleep or ecstasy, one that conveys a revelation, a writing as a poem purporting to represent something beheld in a revelatory dream, trance, or ecstasy, a vivid concept or object of imaginative contemplation, the apparition of a person, a visual image without corporeal presence, and here's the one I like, a manifestation to the senses of something immaterial, a manifestation to the senses of something immaterial, a manifestation to the senses of something immaterial. I like that. So those are a few definitions of the word vision. In plain talk though, I perceive vision as the state of my inner verse. When I close my eyes and see darkness there and sit in quiet contemplation, what images does God place in my head? What images are floating up from my heart to my head? What am I seeing in my inner verse about a particular thing or my state of being in the present or future or a turn of events that is about to happen? Or even more plain spokenly, how are the desires of my heart visualized in my inner verse? When I close my eyes and see blackness, darkness, as I meditate, how are my heart's desires visualized on the motion picture screen that is present in my inner verse? That's vision. And what Augmandino is saying in this introduction is this, you cannot rise above the level of your vision. So if there's nothing on the movie screen, where you gonna go? But as you begin and to develop that inner picture on that inner movie screen of what you want to happen you begin to move toward it and are eligible and available to rise even above that into higher heights vision so important for a lack of it the word says the people perish so Augmandino concludes his introduction to lesson nine, how to make the most of your abilities with this. From his book, Achieving Real Happiness, Kenneth Hildebrandt, a compassionate observer of human frailties, provides you with a simple plan which will enable you to take full advantage of the talents you already possess. Listen carefully. So let us now move into the mind of Kenneth Hildebrand and into the pages of his 1955 book, Achieving Real Happiness. The guiding thought for lesson nine comes from this book. And here's the guiding thought. How is it that many individuals who possess only limited capabilities manage to attract great admiration for extraordinary results? How is it that that many individuals who possess only limited capabilities manage to attract great admiration for extraordinary results? That is a question. How is it that many individuals who possess only limited capabilities manage to attract great admiration for extraordinary results? So let us dig right there, brothers and sisters. Lesson nine, how to make the most of your abilities. Page 86 more questions. What is the secret which harnesses ordinary powers to outstanding achievements? How do some individuals attract admiration for extraordinary results when actually they possess only limited talent? What is the secret which harnesses ordinary powers to outstanding achievements? How do some individuals attract admiration for extraordinary results when actually they possess only limited talent? Talent. Think of the word talent as synonymous with ability and several suggestions on how to make the most of our own capabilities will become evident. And then author Kenneth Hildebrand begins to detail what he calls his suggestions on how to make the most of our own capabilities. Suggestions on how to make the most of our own capabilities. Suggestion number one, take stock of your abilities. Take stock of your abilities. What talents do we possess? What are our assets, our strong points? We should also take our inclinations into account. Possibly we have several talents, any one of which could develop into something useful and satisfying if we were to pursue it. Our inclination helps us decide which of our assets to develop. 
Page 87. If we had our druthers of what to do with our abilities, what would we choose? This is a question in another form that I would ask way back in the day when I was life coaching in my own practice. I would always ask, if money was not an issue and you had more money than you'd ever need for the rest of your life, how would you choose to spend your time? What would you do? What kind of work would you engage in for the rest of your days? And that is a take on this very question that Kenneth Hildebrand is asking in this lesson. If we had our druthers of what to do with our abilities, what would we choose? What would we choose? A talk with a wise friend, a clergyman, a banker, a lawyer, or a vocational counselor may help. Perhaps we should take vocational guidance tests to reveal our potentials. Such consultation and analysis should aid in determining the area in which we should strive to use our abilities. In taking stock of our abilities, we should ask ourselves if the area in which we have talent is feasible. Is our ambition ambition feasible? Does it lie in the range of practical possibility? Does it lie in the range of practical possibility? If not, we are wise to turn our aspirations to other channels. We should begin by surveying the opportunities open to us. Situations which at first appear as roadblocks may later reveal themselves as walls of guidance. Page 88, suggestion number two. Discipline our abilities for maximum usefulness. Discipline our abilities for maximum usefulness. Discipline is a key word. Discipline is a key word in life. Discipline is a key to mastery. Discipline. Success demands foresight and industry. It responds to thought and care. Thorough preparation is imperative if we are to use our capabilities to the fullest. The greatest undiscovered resources in the world lie under our hats and stand in our shoes. It is our responsibility to develop them. Someone receives a promotion, gets an important assignment, makes a major discovery, or moves into the the president's office, he was lucky, an envious person remarks. He gets the breaks. They're always in his favor. In reality, luck or the breaks of life had little or nothing to do with it. So-called luck usually is found at the exact point where preparation meets opportunity. For a time, an individual may get ahead by pull, quote unquote pull, but eventually someone with push will displace him. That's a word right there. For a time, an individual may get ahead by pull, quote unquote pull, but eventually someone with push will displace him. Success is not due to a fortuitous concourse of stars at birth but to a steady trail of sparks from the grindstone of hard work each day. Now, I will take exception with the first part of that sentence. When he says here, success is not due to a fortuitous concourse of stars at birth, I do take exception with that. And we can talk about that on another day at another time. In the meantime, and in between time, let's keep pushing with this lesson number nine, how to make the most of your abilities. Page 89, a definite sense of purpose also adds a strong motivation toward making the most of our abilities. So suggestion number three is possess a sense of purpose. Possess a sense of purpose. Nor will we cultivate and develop our capacities to their fullest until a compelling purpose inspires us to do so. We all know that purpose makes a difference. A clear picture of what we wish to accomplish and the determination to reach our goal strengthens our power to achieve it. It can make the difference between success and failure, frustration and zest for living, happiness and unhappiness. Strong lives are motivated by dynamic purposes. Lesser ones exist on wishes and inclinations. The most glowing successes are but the reflections of an inner fire. The most glowing successes are but the reflections of an inner fire. 
fire. That inner fire is important. That inner fire is connected to the vision that you see on the movie screen in your mind and imagination. They're related. The vision and the inner fire. Page 90. Multitudes of people drifting aimlessly to and fro without a set purpose deny themselves such fulfillment of their capacities and the satisfying happiness which attends it. They are not wicked. They are only shallow. They are not mean or vicious. They simply are empty. Shake them and they would rattle like gourds. They lack range, depth, and conviction. Without purpose, their lives ultimately wander into the morass of dissatisfaction. Y'all know any people like that? Do you know any people like this? Multitudes drifting aimlessly to and fro without a set purpose deny themselves such fulfillment of their capacities and the satisfying happiness which attends it. They are not wicked. They are only shallow. They are not mean or vicious. They simply are empty. Shake them and they would rattle like gourds. They lack range, depth, and conviction. Without purpose, their lives ultimately wander into the morass of dissatisfaction. As we harness our abilities to a steady purpose and undertake the long pull toward its accomplishment, rich compensations reward us. A sense of purpose simplifies life and therefore concentrates our abilities. And concentration adds power. That's no worthy. Concentration adds power. The more you hyper-focus and single-mindedly concentrate on your purpose, following your vision, the more power, spiritual power, is added unto you. Kenneth Hildebrandt continues, Without a corresponding sense of purpose, can we reach the levels of attainment which lie within our powers to achieve? Sustained by such a purpose, will any hardship thwart or deter us? Consult some difficult chapter in your personal experience for the answer. Perhaps your struggle to gain an education, you had to make your own way financially, and the going was hard. You received little help except from your own two hands and your will to succeed. You did without many things the other students had, and there were periods when you did not think that you would be able to pull through, but somehow you did. The proud day finally arrived when with your mortarboard on your head and your gown draped around your shoulders, you waved your sheepskin triumphantly and shouted, I have done it. You would not wish to go through that trying period again. But is it not true that some of the most precious personal values you then received would not be yours if the way had been easy and the road smooth? Your talents were tempered and expanded. You learned patience and endurance and the value of money. The sacrifices you were called to make proved worthwhile and you do not regret the hardships you endured. The lesson is clear. In whatever area we may wish to apply our our abilities and to find the happiness of personal accomplishment, we must be willing to sacrifice for the expansion of our talents. Page 91. Having taken stock of our inclinations and abilities and having prepared them for use in the light of a compelling purpose, the next step is to put our talents to work. So suggestion number four is to put your talents to work. Put your talents to work. In using them, we develop them. Even if our abilities seem small to us or the opportunity to use them seems insignificant, it is important to exercise them to the fullest. Exercise what? Exercise your talents to the fullest. The third servant in the parable, this is the parable of the talents, was condemned, not because he had used his talent for an evil purpose, but because he had failed to use it at all. That was his shortcoming. The third servant in the parable was condemned, not because he had used his talent for an evil purpose, but because he had failed to use it at all. That was his shortcoming. The practical truth of this insight is demonstrated all about us. People with ordinary talents often achieve more than those with greater physical and intellectual endowments because they work harder with what they have. When we match our abilities against something hard each day, some task that seems beyond our capacity, we are exercising will, mind, and body to good purpose. As we master hard things, we gain the ability to handle still more difficult assignments and fuller responsibilities. As we struggle, we grow. 
page 92. In putting our talents to work, imagination adds amazing outreach to our capacities. So suggestion number five is use your imagination. Use your imagination. In putting our talents to work, imagination adds amazing outreach to our capacities. It opens doors of achievement and happiness which we do not anticipate and which once we would have believed to be beyond our wildest hopes of attainment. The power of imagination is one of man's greatest assets, one of the qualities which makes him unique. From one step to another, imagination has led mankind to the heights of achievement. It has produced every article we use, made every discovery for the betterment of our health and comfort, built every church and institution, and sponsored the manifold complexities of modern civilization. It is the priceless ingredient for moral, sociological, and scientific advance, a better day, and a happier personal life. When we fail to use imagination, our lives become routine. Routine leads to a rut of complacency, and complacency is deadly to the creative expansion of our skills. Imagination looks at each situation with fresh eyes and discovers possibilities hitherto unseen. Page 93. Imagination is important. So is enthusiasm. So suggestion number six is be enthusiastic. Be enthusiastic. In the parable, we back to the parable again, the man who hid his talent in the earth lacked both imagination and enthusiasm. Even a superficial study of successful personalities reveals that without exception, they are imbued with enthusiasm for their work and are alive with ideas for the future. They are excited about what they are doing and they communicate the excitement to others. Their abilities take on a powerful thrust which they would lack without it. Enthusiasm does that to our abilities. It places a light inside. It makes them glow with warmth and vitality. The word itself comes from the root meaning of quote-unquote God-possessed. This makes clear both the source and the importance which the ancients attached to the quality of enthusiasm. A glance at its synonyms reveals why this should be so. Eagerness, warmth, ardor, fervor, verve, vigor. Nothing kindles fire like fire. Don't that take you back to iron sharpens iron? Nothing kindles fire like like fire. When we are aflame with enthusiasm, our powers expand and our wholeheartedness becomes contagious. But enthusiasm, imagination, and even purpose cannot reach satisfying objectives until they are yoked with persistent, determined effort. It follows then that we must persevere in the use of our talents. Then author Kenneth Hildebrand talks about the wishbone, the jawbone, and the backbone. It's the wishbone that keeps you going after things. It's the jawbone that helps you ask the questions that are necessary to finding them. Finding what? The things you're going after. And it's the backbone that keeps you at it until you get them. Then what? The things you're going after. The wishbone, the jawbone, and the backbone. Page 94. To find the happiness which comes through making the most of our abilities, we must persevere in using them and making them responsive to our bidding. Persistent effort often spells the difference between success and failure, as in splitting a log in which all former axe strokes are wasted if we do not keep at it until we strike the last blow. So we waste our energies unless we demonstrate the tenacity to endure until the walls of difficulty crumble and our abilities come into their own. I like the idea of our abilities coming into their own. Our abilities have a life cycle in and of themselves. Our abilities, our spiritual gifts, they have a life cycle and they come into their own. This is part of nature. There's a beginning, there's an expansion, there's a peak, and then there's a slow decline. This is a circle and that circle repeats itself. You can see that in the four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. That repeat round and round and round year after year after year in circular motion. Four seasons repeating perpetually. 
Certainly, little of lasting worth ever has been accomplished except by those who have dared to persist in the face of frowning circumstances. Something within them was superior to the obstacles they encountered. A final suggestion is to fill our present place to overflowing. So the seventh and final suggestion is to fill your present place to overflowing. Fill your present place to overflowing. Whatever position we may occupy, we can give it the benefit of our finest effort. One more again. Whatever position we may occupy, we can give it the benefit of our finest effort. Our finest effort. A man may say to himself, I am too good for this job. It is too small a position for a person of my talents. There is no opportunity here to expand my powers. In contempt, he refuses to invest his complete capacities in the meager job. Job. Inevitably, he becomes dissatisfied, restless, and unhappy. He fails his responsibility. He fails his own future opportunity. And worst of all, he fails himself. Then Kenneth Hildebrand talks about the principle of not how much, but how well. Not how much you do, but how well you do it. Not how much, but how well. And author Kenneth Hildebrand concludes lesson nine with this. Consider this fine sentence. God has never put anyone in a place too small to grow. Wherever our place may be, on the farm, in the office, behind a counter, at a teacher's desk, in a kitchen, wearing a uniform, or caring for a child, when we fill that place to the best of our abilities, personal growth is inevitable. Three things at least begin to happen. We do a better job of what we are doing. We expand our talents through vigorous use and we fit ourselves for larger responsibility and wider opportunity. So let's recap suggestion number one. Take stock of your abilities. Suggestion number two. Discipline your abilities for maximum usefulness. Suggestion number three. Possess a sense of purpose. Suggestion number four. Put your talents to work. Suggestion number five. Use your imagination. Suggestion number six, be enthusiastic. Suggestion number seven, fill your present place to overflowing. August 1965. Lyndon B. Johnson is the 36th president of these United States. The West African country of Gambia breaks free of UK colonization. Malcolm X is assassinated mid-speech in the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem. The Vietnam War is raging abroad as many Americans stateside are enraged. The bloody Selma to Montgomery protest marches in early spring lead to the passage of the Voting Rights Act on August 6th of that year. Now, just two days before the signing of that landmark legislation, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as part of his Four City Freedom Now tour, brought his message of gratitude and empowerment to black neighborhoods in Philadelphia, speaking on August 4th, 1965, at the Baptist Temple. Here's a bit of what he said there. Not enough. 
the problem. It messes up our school. You know, it's a strange thing about life. God made it that way, Lord, I'm glad he did. He put an interrelated structure in reality. You can't hold a man down in the valley without staying down there with him to keep him there. Now, brothers and sisters, Baptist Temple, the venue where Dr. King was speaking in 1965, Baptist Temple first opened its doors at 1837 Broad Street in 1891 under the leadership of Pastor Russell Herman Conwell, who was originally from South Worthington, Massachusetts, and who had been pastor of that church since 1882, when its congregants gathered at their former location under the name of Grace Baptist Church of Philadelphia. Now, when Pastor Conwell arrived in 1882, he began holding evening classes for the working poor in that North Philly neighborhood tutoring eager students from throughout the community in the church basement with the goal of giving, quote, education to those who were unable to get it through the usual channels, end quote. Now, these after-work classes became extremely popular in the mid-1880s, putting Grace Baptist Church of Philadelphia on the local map in a big way, eventually becoming what we would call today a megachurch. And on May 12, 1888, some six years after Russell Herman Conwell became pastor, and largely because of his by that time famous evening tutoring, by mandate of the church church's board of trustees, those evening classes became Temple College of Philadelphia, and we know it today as Temple University. The venue where Dr. King spoke that August day in 1965 is now known as the Temple Performing Arts Center. And all of that brothers and sisters, brings us to Og Mandino's 1982 book, University of Success, and to Lesson 10, How to Grow and Prosper in Your Own Acre of Diamonds. How to Grow and Prosper in Your Own Acre of Diamonds. The phrase Acre of Diamonds is taken from a now famous speech presented by Russell Herman Conwell over 6,000 times during his lifetime. It was largely the speaking fees received from presenting this speech throughout the country and all over the world that fueled the early growth and expansion of what is now Temple University. Russell Conwell's guiding thought for this Lesson 10 at the University of Success is this. Many of us spend our lives searching for success when it is usually so close that we can reach out and touch it. One more again. Many of us spend our lives searching for success when it is usually so close that we can reach out and touch it. Mr. Russell Herman Conwell's guiding thought for this lesson 10, which is titled How to Grow and Prosper in Your Own Acre of Diamonds. How to Grow and Prosper in Your Own Acre of Diamonds. That's today's lesson taken from Russell Conwell's famous speech titled Acres of Diamonds. In his introduction to this lesson, author Og Mandino writes, The lecture you are about to hear is one of the all-time classic pieces of success material. First delivered at a reunion of his old Civil War comrades, Russell H. Conwell went on to give the speech Acres of Diamonds more than 5,000 times to enthralled audiences across the nation, earning for his efforts several million dollars with which he founded Temple University, end quote. And here's what Russell Conwell says in his own introduction to his Acres of Diamonds lecture. Quote, 
This lecture has been delivered under these circumstances. I visit a town or city and try to arrive there early enough to see the postmaster, the barber, the keeper of the hotel, the principal of the schools, and the ministers of some of the churches, and then go into some of the factories and stores and talk with the people and get into sympathy with the local conditions of that town or city and see what has been their history, what opportunities they had, and what they had failed to do and every town fails to do something, and then go to the lecture and talk to those people about the subjects which applied to their locality. The idea is that in this country of ours, everyone has the opportunity to make more of himself in his own environment, with his own skill, with his own energy, and with his own friends." End quote. That was Mr. Russell Herman Conwell introducing this lecture, number 10, titled How to Grow and Prosper in Your Own Acre of Diamonds, taken from Og Mandino's 1982 book, The University of Success. So let's get into it. In the year 1843, a man was born who, during his lifetime, was to have a profound effect on millions of people. His name was Russell Herman Conwell. He became a lawyer, then a newspaper editor, and finally a clergyman. Well, one day, a group of boys came to Dr. Conwell at his church and asked him if he would be willing to instruct them in college courses. They wanted a college education, but lacked the money to pay for it. He told them that he'd do all he could, and. As the boys left, a thought, an idea began to form in Dr. Conwell's mind. He asked himself, why couldn't there be a fine college for poor but deserving young men? Well, here was a great idea, and he went to work on it at once. Almost single-handedly, Dr. Conwell raised $7 million with which he founded one of the world's leading universities. And he raised the money by giving more than 6,000 lectures all over the country, and in each one of them, he told the story called Acres of Diamonds. The story was the account of an African farmer who heard tales about other settlers who had made millions by discovering diamond mines. And these tales so excited the farmer that he could hardly wait to sell his farm and search for diamonds himself. So he sold his farm and spent the rest of his life wandering the vast African continent, searching unsuccessfully for the gleaming gems which brought such high prices on the markets of the world. Finally, in a fit of despondency, broke and desperate, as I remember the story, he threw himself into a river and drowned. Now, meanwhile, the man who had bought his farm one day found a large and unusual stone in a stream which cut through the property. And the stone turned out to be a great diamond of enormous value. And he then discovered that the farm was covered with them and it was to become one of the world's richest diamond mines. The first farmer had owned literally acres of diamonds, but had sold them for practically nothing in order to look for them elsewhere. If he'd only taken the time to study and prepare himself to learn what diamonds looked like in their rough state and had first thoroughly explored the land he owned, he would have found the millions he sought right on his own property. The thing about this story that so profoundly affected Dr. Conwell and subsequently millions of others was the idea that each of us is, at this moment, standing in the middle of his own acres of diamonds. If we will only have the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the work in which we're now engaged, we'll usually find that it contains the riches we seek, whether they be financial or intangible or both. There's nothing more pitiful to my mind than the person who wastes his life running from one thing to another, forever looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and never staying with one thing long enough to find it. No matter what your goal may be, perhaps the road to it can be found in the very thing in which you're now engaged. You see, the average man believes some businesses are better than others, instead of realizing the truth that there are no bad businesses. 
There are just those people who don't know enough to see the opportunities in the work they're in. No matter what our work happens to be, it's our business. We're the manager. If there seems to be no future or opportunity in it, it isn't always because it's not there, but perhaps only because we can't see it. A farmer once poked a tiny pumpkin into an empty jug. The pumpkin grew until it completely filled the jug and could grow no more. When the farmer broke the glass, he had a pumpkin exactly the size and shape of the jug. If we're not careful, each of us can do a similar thing. We can mistakenly poke ourselves into jugs that limit our growth. But it is we who do the poking, not the job, not the company, nor the territory, nor the economy, nor the times. We do it. People who become outstanding at their work are those who see their work as an opportunity for growth and development and who prepare themselves for the opportunities which surround them every day. Preparation is the key. This means becoming so good, so competent at what we're now doing, we will actually force the opportunities we seek to come our way. It takes imagination, creative imagination, to know that diamonds don't look like diamonds in their rough state, nor does a pile of iron ore look like iron or steel. Great opportunities lurk constantly in every aspect of the work in which we now find ourselves. In order to begin prospecting your acres of diamonds, start to develop a faculty called intelligent objectivity. The ability to stand off and look at your job as a stranger might, a stranger who considers your pasture greener than his own. To do this, start at the beginning. Within the framework of what industry or profession does your job fall? Do you know all you can know about your industry? How did it begin? Why did it begin? Who started it and when? What's your industry's annual dollar volume? How fast has it grown during the past 20 years? What's his projected growth during the next 10 years? In short, start now to become a student of your industry. You'll be amazed at the results. In five years or less, you can become a national expert in your field. And it's the experts who write their own tickets in life. Surveys indicate that the great majority of people seem to look at their jobs as being as far as they can go. That's the end of the line. They need to realize how really desperately an expanding and dynamic industry needs and seeks the uncommon person who is prepared to share in its growth. How richly it will reward this person of vision and action. On the other hand, those who are not preparing and growing are not just standing still. In relation to their industry, they're going backwards. So ask yourself, do I know as much about my job and my industry as a good doctor or lawyer knows about his job, his profession? You should, you know. This is the attitude of the person who wants to become a professional at what he does for a living. It's far more fun, many times more rewarding and interesting, and the real pro can ride out occasional storms in the economic seas in a safe boat built of research and preparation. In order to become a professional in a world of amateurs, we need to study three important subjects. One, our company and the industry in which it operates. Two, our job and perhaps the next step upward in our career. And three, we need to study people, since successfully serving and getting along with people will determine our success or failure. These are three subjects on which you can gradually build a fine home library. Your bookstore clerk will help you find the right books if you'll tell him what you want to know. Frequently, all you need in order to make an enormous improvement is simply a reminder of things you've known but have forgotten. Perhaps this study and research in your job, your industry, and ways of increasing your service to others sounds like a big job. Well, it is, but it's fascinating, and in the long run, it pays tremendous dividends, builds complete security, and it can be accomplished in an hour a day devoted to reading and making permanent notes. Think of ways and means by which you can increase your contribution to your company, your industry, and those whom you serve. You'll begin to notice a wonderful change in your world, for as ye sow, so shall ye reap. This applies just as much to the family as it does to the breadwinner. The minute you adopt this attitude, you've joined the top 5% of the people of the world. You've virtually removed all competition. You're creating rather than competing. You're affecting life rather than just being affected by it. You're becoming a creator and a giver to life instead of just a receiver. By taking this attitude toward your work, your company and industry, you're automatically taking care of two vital parts of successful living. First, you'll find yourself becoming more interested and enthusiastic about your work and its future, and both interest and enthusiasm are contagious. And second, 
you're building financial security which will last a lifetime. So keep this thought in mind as often as you can on and off the job. Somewhere in your present work, there lurks an opportunity which will bring you everything you could possibly want for yourself and your family. It will not be labeled opportunity. It will be hidden in common everyday garments, just as was the hairpin with which a man fashioned the first paper clip or the dirty drinking glass which triggered the paper cup industry. Now, in closing, here are 12 points to remember. One, if we'll develop the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the work in which we're now engaged, we will very likely find it contains the riches, tangible and intangible, we seek. Two, before we go running off into what we think are greener pastures, let's realize our own pasture is probably unlimited. Three, there are no bad jobs. It's the way in which we go about our work that makes it good or bad. Four, let's not poke ourselves into jugs beyond which we cannot grow. Let's avoid self-limitation. Five, only preparation can ensure our taking advantage of the opportunities which will present themselves in the future, opportunities which are around us now. Let's begin to prepare now. Six, put your imagination to work on the many ways and means of improving what you're now doing. Seven, learn all you can about your job, your company, and your industry. Eight, since there's no limit to the growth of your industry, it must follow there's similarly no limit to your growth potential within that industry. Nine, our dynamic and growing economy needs and will well reward the uncommon person who prepares for a place in its growth. Ten, begin to build your library of reference material pertaining to your company, industry, job, and on how to better serve and get along with people. Eleven, set aside an hour a day for this study and research. Twelve, remember the story of the Acres of Diamonds. <laughs>